Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to sunny Portugal. Portugal is quite an intriguing country. Uh, it's actually been discovered by tourism uh, lately and where it, it had a regular uh, tourism, but it now one of the most attractive countries in Europe for tourism. Uh, they, it is right now one of the top 20 most visited countries in the world and they uh, welcome over 20 million foreign tourists each year. Uh, of course, this year has been different with COVID-19, but on a regular basis. Uh, in 2017, Portugal was elected both Europe's leading destination and world's leading destination. Uh, what is interesting too is that it has also become a, a country uh, to move to end your your life. Just uh, uh, people are buying houses because it was still cheaper than uh, France or, or Spain, and but and then uh, just move there to for their later years. So let's look at uh, the physical aspect of Portugal, the, the regions of it. And uh, here you have also a, a good idea of how uh, high the mountains are in the north and then a pretty flat country in the south. This is, of course, the satellite view. And here you can see how uh, the country is literally uh, split into uh, by the Tagus uh, River that uh, goes in uh, goes into the sea and uh, in Lisbon. So you see uh, there comes here is the the, the Tagus. Uh, the different region the Algarve, the Bajo, Alentejo, Alto, Alentejo, Ribatejo, Estremadura, Beja, Baixa or Litoral or Alta, Duro, Litoral, this is where we find Porto, Minho and Hassos Montes. So these are uh, uh, some of the places that we're going to look at. So you can go back to the map and you can uh, locate it on it. Here is the uh, Portuguese flag, green, red and yellow. And then the region of Lisboa, which is very rich with uh, sites, uh, I am highlighted beside Lisboa, of course, Queluche, Sintra, and uh, Mafra. Most of the prehistoric things that we're going to see are in the southern part of, um, of uh, Portugal, as well as in quite up north. Uh, here for the caves and the Celtic houses uh, over there. We have also some, some Comlesh that we'll see in the Roman temple uh, just um, east of Lisboa. The region was uh, inhabited by Neanderthals and then by the Homo sapiens, sapiens as uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, the, some of the oldest traces of civilization are seen in the prehistoric cave in the Alentejo. Uh, here you can see, this is the cover of a book, like this is the only thing that I could find, uh, shows some of um, these very nice, almost engraving in the rock. Uh, in the Valle de Coa uh, caves, here are some horses also, kind of petroglyphs if you want. And then all kinds of other works. Unfortunately, I couldn't find better reproduction. Between 4000 and, and 2000 BC, uh, Portugal and Galicia developed an original megalithic culture that can be compared to the rest of the peninsula. Uh, there are still some monumental uh, traces in the country and mostly in the Alentejo, so in the southern part of Portugal. Uh, you see uh, on the left a dolmen. So dolmen was uh, typically 
uh, made of uh, uh, some erected stones then covered with a huge stone. And these were used typically as um, tombs. They often were covered by uh, soil and rocks. So the dolmen, as you see, his, the definition would be type of single chamber megalithic tomb made of two or more vertical megaliths. The menhir on the other side that you see here is a tall upright stone. And this you find, uh, we'll see it in many other places in Europe, uh, but the menhir, and these are, can be very large. It can be over 30 feet high. This one is um, 10 feet high, a little more than 10 feet high. The Comlesh of the Al Almendres um, is a megalithic complex. It's located near Evra in the Alentejo, so again in the, second, the, the southern part of Portugal. And these are circles. When you talk about Comlesh, these are circles of stones. Similar to uh, Stonehenge, though they, the stones are even larger, uh, but uh, these were serving some uh, purposes typically um, these were no tombs, but would have uh, served a ritual uh, purpose. This is the largest um, group of menhir in the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Here you can see how it evolved, just like we saw if you study Stonehenge, you can see you have a first build uh, in the uh, old Neolithic period. This is in the medium Neolithic period. Uh, so the small uh, circles, two double circles, are now next connected to a larger oval. And then the, in the end of the Neolithic, uh, the Almendres tree, you have a connection between the two. And then here is uh, in the actual location, the um, condition. Again, this is that circle, 92 of the many years from two grounds, and uh, they were built and oriented to different, different directions that were associated with the equinox. It's interesting, they found some parallels with the maximum, maximum uh, moon elongation. And you can see some have some engraving on the many years. So if we look at uh, the Iberic Peninsula, here's the way it looked before the Carthaginian conquest, around uh, 30, uh, 300 BCE, so before uh, the common era. And so you can see different uh, tribes that had settled, uh, all coming very often from Central Europe. Uh, according to the colors, you have the Tour de Tani, the Tartessian, the Celtic here, all in the very pale yellow, the Iberian, the Aquitanian, and so this is in relationship with Aquitania in France. So if you expand it to the, the French territory, it would go about that far. And then Indo-European uh, pre-Celtic, so these were all the tribes that were already set here, the Lusitani and the Vetones, and the mixture of the Galesi and these uh, Indo-European tribes. And this is really going to make, this is Galicia uh, now, and we know the very strong connection between Galicia and Portugal, where the Portuguese uh, language is going to develop from the Galician language. On the coast, you can see the upcoming Phoenician and Carthaginian um, settlement, typically trading posts that develop into a little town. And then here, uh, two rod and emporium uh, that are settled by the Greeks.
around that period and actually even a, a little prior to that, but we have some megalithic monuments that, that can be found all the way in the south in Algarve. A very large tholos has 89 feet diameter um, and you can see the entrance there that would lead you to a tomb. The, uh, just to help you in the vocabulary, the cairn is a man-made uh, pile of stones. This comes from the Scottish Gaelic cairn. And the tholos is a beehive uh, tomb, as you can see here. Unfortunately, the top had kind of caved in. It's a circular building with a conical or vaulted roof. It's not a real vault, by the way, but it comes close. And you always have an alley, a kind of corridor that leads from the door all the way to the center of the monument. Here you can see the door with these large stones that are in post and lintel um, construction process. A certain culture is going to uh, establish itself once the, you have the invasion by the Celts. This is about the first millennium uh, BC, before common era. The Celts invade Portugal from Central Europe, and they're going to intermarry with the local popul population and forming different tribes. This is called the Castro culture, uh, Castreja. And I apologize right away, I have a very bad Portuguese accent because I don't speak it. And the accent in Portuguese uh, extremely, extremely difficult. So um, during that period and until the Roman invasion, the Castro cultures was very prolific in uh, Portugal and in modern Galicia in the north. Uh, they, they were called Dun or Duin in Gaelic uh, and the Roman called it Castre in their chronicle. About a hundred residential compounds were found in that area in the northern part of the uh, of Portugal. And they had literally, as you can see, that was a little city with streets, uh, masonry walls, you had working space for large families, uh, you had uh, one to three circular stone houses uh, with an atrium. So these were already um, quite sophisticated. The cosmogony of the Celtics remained pretty homogeneous uh, due to the ability of the Druids to meet in councils with the Druids of other regions. So they had a lot of connection, the, the religious part, and as you know, religion was always very powerful at that time because they were healers, that they were the one that seemed to have a, an extra power. And so they had a lot of uh, contacts with one another. This is a reconstructed uh, Celtic house in the Citania de Briteiros uh, that dates back to uh, between 900 and 100 BCE. So it was this kind of circular houses. And uh, some uh, sculptures were very interesting. This is a statue of a Galician warrior of the Castro culture. And then, of, of course, we have the Romans. The Romans are going to uh, invade. This is the way the, the empire was uh, split be, with uh, diocese, dioceses. And we have to realize that dioceses has been borrowed by the Christian church, but it was originally part of the organization of the Roman administration. There were these different regions that reported to uh, some um, authorities. And so when the uh, Christian church organized itself, they literally copied what was done by the Romans. The Romans first invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 219, when they expelled the Carthaginians from the, the coast. Uh, but Portugal took another 200 years before they were able to um, conquer it. 
So the way it was is around 155, there was a rebellion beginning in the north and they were really fighting the Romans badly. So the Romans decided they were going to change their strategy. They bribed uh, one of uh, the uh, allies to the rebel chieftain uh, and uh, he was assassinated. And then another one took the lead and he became an ally to the Roman. And so uh, in 27 BC, Lusitania gained the status of Roman province. So there's still a lot of uh, uh, Castros, the hill forts that you can find uh, in many places. And some, some uh, Roman uh, ruins. This is a lovely Roman temple at Evra that looked at the time like this. Uh, this was uh, the temple had been recycled in a medieval uh, building. It gave it an aspect of a tower. So it was at the same time a tower, a temple, and a strong house. And this happens very often with these old buildings. Uh, people don't know what to do. They don't uh, have any other purpose because now you have Christianity around. If they're not used as quarry to recycle the stones, then they are uh, used for different uh, purposes. So the temple was destroyed during the fifth century at the time of the invasions of Germanic people. By the 14th century, the space served as a strong house for the town's castle. By 1467, people removed some stones to, for building purposes and for defense. And from the 14th century until uh, 1836, the temple turned tower was used as a butcher shop, often called the Temple of Diana, though it might have been dedicated to Jupiter. And so finally in 1872, the vestiges of the medieval structures were finally removed. And then they had a program of restoration uh, for the, that temple. The original temple probably looked very much like the Maison Carré in Nîmes that you see here on the bottom. Uh, very pretty uh, temples that themselves are inspired by the Etruscan uh, way of um, building the temples uh, on a uh, base and then having some of the columns in uh, literally uh, within the wall, partly within the walls. In other places, we find the remnants of uh, villas. Uh, this was uh, in Centum Celas, the Villa Rustica probably the property of a wealthy Roman citizen. Uh, he was a trademan of tin uh, that we, they found uh, in probably some, uh, um, not archives, but engravings inside the house that they could uh, lend to that uh, information. It was one of the richest uh, places for that kind of an ore, tin. Uh, some uh, Roman tombstone, and that tells you right away that wine was already a very important uh, industry in Portugal, where the tombstones are in the shape of wooden wine barrels. This is again from the southern part of Portugal in Alentejo. So to go on with the, the immigration, the immigration pattern, all these uh, big um, movements of, of people that come because of the arrival of the Huns. The Huns are moving population westward. And one of the most important tribes that comes from Central Europe are the Suevi uh, that are going to settle in the northwestern part of the peninsula. And that covers the, uh, what is now Galicia and the northern part of um, Portugal. These were Germanic tribes. Um, they first uh, crossed the Rhine and uh, uh, went over uh, Spain, but then they decided to 
uh, settle in and create what is called the kingdom of the Suevi. What is interesting is that the Portuguese way of living in these uh, northern region, uh, so north of the famous Tagus, uh, is mostly inherited from the Suevi uh, because they mostly have small farms. And this is in total contrast with what's happening in the southern part of Portugal, uh, where you have very large properties. So the, the tradition goes back all the way there. So this is the sixth, fifth and sixth century. And then it became a Visigothic province. As we know, the Visigoths are going to first settle about uh, in this region, but then decided that this was all open for them and they came in and invaded the rest of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And so we can see that uh, in 585 to uh, 711, uh, the country was pretty much ruled by the Visigoths. There are some um, traces of the Visigoths because they Christianized and we find here a small chapel near Braga that is of the Visigothic um, style, but which brings with them a, a very strong Byzantine influence. Don't forget that in, in uh, Spain itself, you, have, you still have about seven to nine small Visigothic churches dating from before 711. And here you have a parchment showing the king of the Suevi, Miro, and St. Martin of Braga. So Christianization is there. And then, of course, 711 is that pivotal time where the, um, the Moors, I mean, first the, the Islam is going to expand, starting from Medina. As you know, it was an absolutely lightning speed type of uh, conquest in a very few years, as you can see, the, uh, under Mohammed between 622 and 32, they, they, they conquered that whole part of what is now Saudi Arabia. By 632 to 661, they go all the way to Tripoli, uh, all the way to uh, what is now, now Armenia and Afghanistan. So it's a huge territory that they cover by then. And then, uh, of course, we have in, uh, from 661 to 750, the territories that are added by the Umayyad Caliphs. And so they push here. And of course, in 711, the one very proud uh, Visigothic king is going to invite the Moors to come and help them beat a neighbor king. And uh, at that time, um, Al-Tariq, who was the, the general, is going to say, yuppie, and I'm, we're going to cross, and uh, we're going to stay there. And within a couple of decades, they conquered the whole Iberian Peninsula. They try their way to France, but that's going to be pushed back. But they make their way to about half of what is Provence now. Of course, the uh, people are not going to let that go. And despite the fact that the Moors are going to bring with them a tremendous culture, uh, Christianity is not going to accept this. And starting in the Asturias, uh, in 750, they're going to push back. And you see with all these colors, this is the pushback that's going to happen. This part in 800, um, this part in 1045, yellow in 1100, 1148, uh, 1213, 1270, this little part in 1470, and then the big push that's going to take down Granada in 1492, and then uh, the whole of Spain is reconquered by the Christian kings. When the Moors were kicked back, you have to realize that not all the Moors left. So you had an enormous population that had settled there. And a lot of the workers are going to stay and are going to go on with their, their skills. 
And so you still find a lot of what is called Mozarabic um, buildings that are still inspired by the uh, by the Moorish styles that we have found during that uh, very rich part of uh, Spanish history. And so I, you have that map here giving you an idea of the enormous amount of buildings that are still um, revolved, uh, still taking after uh, the Islamic buildings and architecture. Here, just an example, you have the Silves Castle, which was a uh, Moorish era outside of the castle of Myrtola. Um, it was occupied by the Ab Abu Iqasim Ahmad Ibn al Hussein in Qasim, sorry for the pronunciation, just outside there uh, where there is a statue erected. He was actually a Sufi and a rebel leader that was uh, working against the uh, dynasty of the Almoravids in Spain. And uh, so he um, pushed them back. And at that time, he became an ally and a friend of Afonso Enriquez, who is the big ancestor to the uh, independent Portugal uh, and became the first king of Portugal. And because of that association, he got assassinated. Uh, at Silves in 1151, so in this area. And you have an idea of how the, the castle would have looked uh, originally. Some, uh, most of the, the mosques that were built all over Portugal uh, were um, destroyed, uh, but some were dis uh, turned into churches and cathedrals. Uh, and so you can't see all the Islamic features, uh, but uh, definitely we can still um, find some of these uh, uh, remains of, of these mosques uh, in some features of the cathedral in Lisbon, for example, in Silves and in Faro. In this, uh, this is one exception is the, in Mertola, which is a small uh, town in the Alentejo, um, the main church uh, that was built in the second half of the 12th century and was a mosque and was turned into a church, but kept all the characteristic of the Islamic uh, style. It's very picturesque. So this is the political map at the end of the 12th century. You see that Portugal is slowly uh, starting to form, and we'll see how it is. From 844, all the coastal regions in the north were also attacked by the Normans and the Vikings uh, raiders. We have to keep these guys in mind that came all the way from uh, Norway uh, and um, Denmark. And they were really uh, trying to, to find and loot as much as they could. So you had constant attacks. When they were not busy in their fields, then they would just jump into their, their longboats and come around the coastline. At the end of the ninth century, the region of Portugal between the river Minho and Douro, so this is in this region, uh, was freed and then reconquered from the moor by a, uh, a general called Vimara Perez on the order of King Alfonso III of the Asturias. And the Asturias are around here. And they were the first territory that pushed back the Moors. And so they formed what it was at first, the um, county of Portugal. The name of the city that was along the coast, uh, where you had two main cities, Portuscale and Braga. And it uh, decided that Portuscale was going to be uh, expanded. And it is from the original name of the city of Porto that comes the word Portugal. Portuscale was evolved into the name of Portugal. Uh, the, the Count Vimaja Perez 
who became the first count of Portugal, uh, saw that all these towns that had been deserted, he wanted to repopulate them and he rebuilt them, rebuilt them with Portuguese and Galician refugees and other Christians. And so he elevated that whole region to the status of county and naming it the County of Portugal. And here's the statue of the Count de Mara Paris. In 1093, Alfonso VI of Leon, which was prior, uh, was named the Asturias prior to that time, uh, bestowed the county to, um, and it's interesting, Henry of Burgundy. He married him to his daughter, Teresa of Leon. And uh, just as a thank you for his role in reconquering the, the land from the Moors. And so Henry moved into his new country uh, formed the country, the, um, the newly formed country, sorry, and uh, uh, pretty quickly uh, he defeated his mother who was trying to go against him and her lover and uh, turned his arms against the Moors. And after the victory in 1139 at the Battle of Orique, he was unanimously proclaimed King of Portugal by his soldiers. And this is when we have the very first house of uh, Portugal, which is, and interestingly enough, the House of Burgundy, which is going to reign from 1128 to 1383. Part of the, the numerous castles that you find in uh, Portugal is uh, the Serra de Sintra, the Castelo dos Moros, the Castle of the Moors. Uh, this uh, was one of the two castles in Sintra, and we'll see Sintra uh, later on. Uh, this one uh, was located and I mean, had an incredibly strategic uh, position there. But once it became ruins, it became like a romantic uh, ruin. It was constructed during the 8th and 9th century. Uh, the, as you can see, the territory around was pretty much agricultural and so it needed to be protected. Uh, so after the conquest of Lisbon in 1147 by the forces loyal to Alonso, Afonso Enriquez, uh, the castle surrendered to the Christian force and then the castle was uh, entrusted to 30 inhabitants that uh, received the privileges uh, by, given by the monarch in 1154. Even a, a chapel was constructed then. And then in 1375, the King Ferdinand I of Portugal uh, ordered the rebuilding of the castles. And so the, the castle itself was uh, fortified and then made more livable. So the second castle, so you saw the one very high up, this is the second castle that was located downhill from the Castelo dos Moros, um, was the residence of the Islamic Moorish Taifa of Lisbon, so these small kingdoms at the time, and then conquered in the 12th century by Afonso Enriquez, uh, who looked the castle for his, took the castle, sorry, for his own use. Uh, the, ordered the construction of the Ala Manuelina, that's later on King Manuel. And you can see how the uh, architecture is going to change. The Manuelina is, of course, a much more decorated type of facade. And there is in that castle these extraordinary uh, large chimney tell you where the kitchen is. Uh, but uh, that uh, castle has a blend of Gothic, Manuelin, Moorish, and Mudejar. Uh, styles and literally was built uh, that way all the way to the 16th century. The palace continued to be inhabited from time to time by the kings. 
And unfortunately, the whole ensemble suffered terrible damage after the 1755 Lisbon earthquake, but then was restored in the old fashioned, uh, old fashioned way. Here is the way it looked in 1509. Inside, you can find different rooms uh, dating from different centuries with a typically Renaissance aspect, but with these typical notes of the Azulejos, these incredible tiles, so typical um, of uh, Portuguese uh, skills there great, great uh, azulejos, and then very, very highly worked uh, ceilings with paintings, a coat of arms, as well as different views uh, here of uh, horses. Kitchens are incredible, and as I told you, are surmounted by these big chimneys, and um, the Saladas Pegas, uh, these are the magpies, and so you have a whole series of representation of uh, magpies on the ceiling. And they hold the emblem for uh, what's called Porbem, for honor. And then the Salas da Cisne, so these are the swan room. So a very beautiful interior, very interesting. The House of Burgundy is going to give uh, way to the House of Avis uh, when in 1383 the King John of Castile, who was the husband of Beatrice of Portugal and the son-in-law of Ferdinand I of Portugal, claimed the throne of Portugal. Uh, so uh, a few noblemen uh, and commoners led by John uh, defeated the Castilian in the battle of, uh, and again, I apologize for the accent, Aljubarrota, uh, but with this battle, the house of Avis became the ruling house of Portugal. And this is really what is going to become the age of discoveries. Some of the buildings that were built at that time, and this is one of a major one, is the uh, monastery of Batalha <clears throat> in Lyra. This extraordinary building is going to house um, the, some of the tombs of the kings of that uh, dynasty. So you can see it's almost like, it looks like in the middle of nowhere when you see it, uh, but uh, was erected by King John I uh, to commemorate his victory against Castile uh, in the uh, 1383 to 1385. It was the Dominican convent, but it would serve as the burial church of the 15th century Avis dynasty. It's one of the best examples of what you can find in the uh, Gothic architecture, but mingled with what is typically Portuguese, which is called the Manuelian style, which means very often extremely highly worked uh, porch, uh, the entrance of the, of the churches or the palace or whatever, as you can see here, they're really marking that uh, location. 15 different architects worked on uh, this uh, monastery. And you can see here the back with uh, all the actually towers that were never finished. So because they went through so many architects, you have different styles, of course. So until 1402, you have the Renault Gothic uh, with some influence of what they call the uh, English perpendicular period, uh, emphasis on vertical lines. Uh, and um, you can compare that to the Canterbury uh, Cathedral. From 1402 to 1438, they move to the flamboyant Gothic style, which is very ornate and probably of Catalan descent. So that's part of the main facade and the dome of the square chapter house. Between 1448 and 1477, there was an addition of a cloister. And so 1480 to 1515, we see the rise of the Manuelian style, 
uh, with the portal of the Capellas Imperfectas that we will see later on, with traceries and arcades that are very typical. And so this is that composite uh, building is absolutely unique. What is interesting too, as you can see, we will see uh, soon here is a view of the main portal of the church. But uh, with all the different decoration, we find uh, some elements and representation that, that really illustrate the discoveries that were brought from the voyages of Vasco de Gama and Pedro Alvarez Cabral. But then suddenly the construction came to a heart when the king decided to put all his efforts in the construction of the Geronimus uh, monastery in Lisbon, and we'll see that one uh, later. Of course, as most of the buildings in that central part of Portugal, uh, the earthquake of 1755 did a lot of damage, as well as did the uh, Napoleonic troops uh, who sacked and burned the complex in 1810 and 11. At that time, the Dominicans were expelled and the church and convent were abandoned and left to fall in ruin. So it is under a King Ferdinand II of Portugal that they decided to start restoring uh, the beautiful monastery. And since 1980, the convent has been turned into a museum. This portal uh, shows a series of 78 statues that are divided in six rows. These display the Old Testament kings, angels, prophets, and saints. The Royal Cloister was not part of the original project, was built between 1448 and 1477, uh, whereas it's very sober from the outside, it's incredibly uh, intricate and sophisticated from the inside and shows all the, the aspects of the flamboyant Gothic style. You have all kind of traceries, quatrefoils, floodly, and rosettes. And beautiful colonnettes, as you can see, with different patterns too. In the founder's chapel, La Capella do Fondador, you have a whole series uh, of uh, a whole series of tombs that are going to uh, contain most of the uh, kings and their family and their families in uh, the, of the, the Avis, um, oh gosh, of the kings of Avis. So again, beautiful work. This is definitely an influence from the Mudeja, so very oriental in flavor. You have uh, tombs from John the First of Portugal and his wife, and many others. In the here, the tombs of four princes from left to right: Ferdinand, John, Henry, and Peter. And but you can see again that a very rich decoration. The Capellas Imperfectas, the unfinished chapel, uh, that series of uh, chapels that were stopped by lack of money, of course. Uh, and so that shows you that the monastery was never finished. They form kind of a separate octagonal structure uh, that's tacked on the choir of the church. And they're only accessible from the outside. You cannot uh, reach them from the inside. So you, at that time, they were supposed to have large towers, as you can see here, uh, but they were interrupted in their work.
these are part of these uh, beautiful uh, vaults of the imperfectas capillas, capillas infer and very interesting decoration all along that is meant uh, I mentioned before, allude to uh, the different um, truths that the uh, that Vasco de Gama and others brought from uh, their great voyages. So you have in the motifs, Amiri spheres, winged angel ropes, circles. Uh, tree stumps, clover shaped arches, and florid projection. So these are all different symbols that were um, included in these great sculptures. Another uh, great building is the Templar of Tamar. After the conquest of the region from the Moor, uh, the land was granted in 1159 uh, to the order of the Knights of the Knights Templar. And so they laid the first stone of the castle and the convent in 1160. And this would become the headquarters of the order in Portugal. It's a very large uh, building. The choice was not just a haphazard hazardous, but uh, was in fact uh, done for mystical reasons and as they say, mis divine inspiration. Uh, reinforcing this magical view is the setting of the site among a small chain of seven uh, elevations. So seven mounts, and this goes back to the seven hills of Jerusalem, the seven hills of Rome, the seven columns of Constantinople. The, Templ the Templars ruled from Tamar, uh, which was a vast region of central Portugal, and they pledged to defend from Moorish attacks and raids. So the villagers that were living around there were given a liberal, ra rather a liberal modes of life, if you want. And they, this way, they attracted a lot of new immigrants. Those inhabitants who could sustain a horse were obliged to pay military service in return for privileges. They were not allowed the title of knight, which was reserved to the Templars. And women were also admitted to the order, although they did not fight. Unfortunately, in 1314, the French king, Philippe IV, uh, who owed an enormous amount of money to the Templar, held the Pope uh, a virtual prisoner and forced him to suppress the order on basis of false accusation and forced confession. The order was then suppressed. Uh, all the possession and personal uh, in Portugal were transferred to a newly created order called the Order of Christ. And by the way, Henry the Navigator, who is going to be the man behind a lot of the uh, great uh, navigation discoveries, uh, is going to be made the governor of that order. And the Templars were, uh, as you know, uh, burned at the stake in many places. Of course, most of the um, riches, all the wells that were in these monasteries were taken over by the new order. Just after 1492, with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, the town increased uh, further with the Jewish refugees, artisans and traders. So that very large Jewish minority dynamized the city with new trades and skills. Um, their experience was vital in the success of the new trade routes with Africa. And so the original um, synagogue still stands there. Unfortunately, under the pressure of the kings of Spain, uh, the, the Portuguese kings soon uh, proclaimed the, by edict that the Jews uh, had to uh, be expelled from Portugal or had to reconvert to Christianity. 
or convert to Christianity. And you know the rest, I mean, again, a lot of people were expropriated, about 38,000 of them. And then they uh, left in a hurry. Talking about the uh, navigation, uh, the Portugal really spearheaded European exploration of the world and the uh, age of discovery. The Prince Henry the Navigator that you see here was the son of King Joao I and became the main sponsor of uh, these uh, exploration. Uh, he is the one, uh, one of the, the most important of the explorer, though he's by far not the only one, but Vasco de Gama uh, was the first to reach India by sea. He was the first to link Europe and Asia by the ocean route, connecting the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, and therefore the West and the Orient. Here is a map showing that uh, the, these voyages of the Portuguese explorators, uh, some were by sea and then by land, and then by sea again, went through uh, because there was no uh, strait there. They had to uh, do it by land in great part, and this part would have been very painful. But in green, it's by Pejo de Covilha, in the red, you have Alfonso de Paiva. In blue, that little thing brought them to Abyssinia, Pejo de, de Covilla, again in 1488. And then the great part was by Vasco de Gama going through the Cape of uh, Good Hope and then establishing all kinds of um, a trading posts all around. And this is going to be the beginning of uh, the great uh, colonization, if you want, by the Portuguese. Here's the map that gives you an idea of all the uh, different places where they went. This is uh, in green, you have the return route coming back. Outward route was this one. And then uh, another one outward was this, starting from the Cape of Good Hope, going all the way to Goa and Cochin. It's amazing when you know the condition they were uh, going there. And this is about what the uh, Portuguese empire was uh, all the way to uh, 1817. In 1494, uh, the two, the Spain and, and Portugal signed the Treaty of Tordesillas uh, at uh, Tordesillas in Spain, uh, and it was later authenticated at Setubal in Portugal. Uh, and this was really delineating uh, what belonged to Portugal and what belonged to Spain. Uh, and they li literally drew that line that was kind of respected, not always, but also quite interesting in total oblivion of other uh, powers in the world. So there we have rather two not that important countries when you see there, but that literally are going to share the world between them. Now, the Portugal, because of the fact that uh, the last two kings of uh, Portugal don't have any heir, uh, are going to enter voluntarily a dynastic union with uh, Spain between 1580 and 1640. Uh, and this is going to, we, we have an idea of here how together 
uh, they dominate uh, most of the what was the known world at that time. Uh, quite incredible. So what's going to uh, happen is that uh, Philip II of Spain is going to claim the throne and will be accepted as Philip I of Portugal. They don't, Portugal will not lose its independence, but it's going to become kind of a union of kingdoms with Spain. This is not going to uh, go too, too well with England, who was one of the oldest ally of uh, Portugal. And so they're going to have a lot of skirmish uh, between them from that time. And then we have the Dutch-Portuguese War between uh, 1595 and 1663, which involves the Dutch companies that were extremely strong, uh, that uh, the Dutch were navigating, were powerhouse uh, in navigation around the world too. And so here's the portrait uh, when what happens is that uh, they finally are not going to be too happy with the, with the Spanish king. And there is an uprising in 1640 and John IV is now going to be proclaimed king. Uh, and there is a Portuguese restoration war that will end this 60 years period of the Iberian Union. Uh, this will be the beginning of what we call the House of Braganza, which reigned in Portugal until 1910. The eldest son came to reign as Afonso VI. So this is John, John IV, Joao IV, painted by Rubens. And uh, this son, King Joao V, they called him the Portuguese Sun King, and I think you can see why. I mean, he's taken all the pomp and circumstances of Louis XIV uh, in the, with the wig and all the, the, the incredible luxury around them. It is under him, for example, uh, that you have some excessive um, use of money money of the poor is definitely this is the coach the oceans coach used in the triumphal entry of this 1716 portuguese envoy to rome on the right and this is absolutely incredible One of the, the buildings that's going to be erected at that time is the Palacio Nacional de, de Mafra, built by Joao V. Uh, it also served as a Franciscan friary. So you have the church, you have the palace, but you have a monastery behind. Uh, this was a consequence of a vow that the king had made in 1711 to build a convent if his wife, Queen Mariana, gave him some offsprings. And so when the first daughter um, came about, the Infanta Barbara of Portugal, the construction of the building started. This is a huge complex. It covers about 40,000 square meters. It's one of the largest royal palace. It was designed by a German architect, Johann Friedrich Ludwig, and was built very much, as you can see, uh, very symmetrically uh, with uh, two pavillons on either ends and then the church in the very middle, the basilica. These are decorated, the basilica is decorated with a lot of Italian statues and has a very large pipe organs that you can't see that are on either side of the nave. Cupola is uh, very beautiful, but very typical of that Baroque period. And then the, one of the main features of the palace is the extraordinary library that contains at least 30,000 rare books. So uh, the empires of 
again, I keep showing you because it's difficult for us to, to fathom, but uh, this is a map showing the Spanish and Portuguese empires in 1790. Okay, at this time, I think I'm going to take a break and uh, we're going to, uh, you please uh, unmute yourself and give me some of your feeling about that amazing adventure of, the, of Portugal and its discoveries at that time. Unmute yourself so I can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, we were in Portugal five years ago, and we took a river cruise through the Douro. Yes. And visited some of the castles. We went to this unbelievable carriage museum. So oh. when I saw that carriage, it reminded me of that museum that had these enormous carriages um, on display. So it was yeah. very good to see this. It just brought it back to me. <laughs> Yeah, was that in, in Porto or was it in Lisbon? It was in Porto. Okay, because there is a big one in, in uh, Lisbon too. Mm. We may yeah. have gone to that one too, it's five years ago. Yeah, I was supposed to be, oh, yeah, on, the, I was supposed to be on the Douro at the end of May. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Everything was, it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. It was a yeah. wonderful, were you taking a river cruise? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it it, it going, but going all the way to Salamanca. We went to Salamanca too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. it started in Lisbon and went up to, to Salamanca. Yeah. yeah, it was great. So, but it's a, Portugal is a really beautiful country. Beautiful, and the people are lovely, lovely. Very much so. I was there. It's a very rich history. Yes. Yeah. And um, they really hate the Spanish. <laughs> Yeah, there, there is still some resentment, definitely. Because um, because they didn't have an heir, it wasn't a happy time at all. They no, they, but you know the last the, the last two one didn't have heirs, and the next one was a uh, cardinal or something. So he, yes, that's right. The, the first one was killed in battle. He was very young. He was in his twenties. But he he died without an heir. Right, right. Yeah, that was foolish of him to do that. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, battles were battles. And yeah. But I, I'm sure you're going to cover it in the next half, but I just wanted to mention one thing. The, I also did that river cruise, and um, close to Salamanca, are you going to do the oldest uh, university at Cambria? Are you going to talk yes, about Yes, we will talk about Coimbra, yeah. Okay, so when we got off the bus, the students came up to us and they were dressed in Harry Potter. Yes, yes. the cape, the black cape, and then yep. they play guitar. So we found out that, um, you know, uh, J.K. Rawlings was married to a Portuguese man. So a lot of her writings take a lot of the things that you see in Portugal. So that, okay. whole, that whole, you know, era, the, the street, the Donegal Street, we actually have a picture of one of those front storefronts and it looks just like something right out of the movie. Oh, it was fabulous. Loved it. Yeah. No, it's, um, the universe, I love the, the uniform and then they come with the guitar and the, yes. the yes. Yeah. Hey Anne, I have a question. Yes. It's, it's well, with all of the exploration by boat and conquist, conquistadores and all of that, they must have had huge shipbuilding facilities around the country of Portugal. Oh, yes, definitely. And that and would they, be, you know, all along the, the coast, they would have, they had um, in the north, because you needed a lot of, of wood, you know, right. timber to do that. So the whole northern part has a lot of forest. And so they must have been probably, extraordinary for trade. Uh, probably Porto would have been one of the, the region where they would do. But I haven't seen any uh, particular information. When you look at Spain, you know where they were building. Yeah. At least was one of the main centers for building ships. But in uh, Portugal, I would assume it's Porto. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, no, it's, it's incredible because when you know the condition, I mean, just going through the Cape of Good Hope was Maybe. such a challenge because you have these two 
currents that are joining, just as you have at the southern part of South America. These are very turbulent waters. And uh, so a lot of ships would sink uh, in that area. And they know because the guys are going to, for, for, the, for the sunken ships trying to find treasures. Mm -hmm. So do you have your coffee and your glass of water? Did you stretch your legs? Oh. <laughs> and my name is Sue and I have a question for you. Thank you for doing this. Um, too. I too was going to go to Portugal this spring. <laughs> Um, not on a boat. I was going on foot. <laughs> so um, my question to you is I was going to do the Camino Trail from the tip, southern tip of Portugal up to Santiago. Okay. And are a lot of the places that you mentioned um, close to the trail? Are you familiar with I, I haven't looked at it from that uh, angle, so I can't tell you. Uh, you have the big cities, of course. Uh, Batalha is, it's reachable. It's not very much north of, uh, of um, uh, Lisbon. Mm -hmm. They have, as everywhere in Europe, they have lots of buses and, and things that go uh, yeah, to I different uh, places. Well, they have trains, train. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, uh, so as you do it, are you doing it by foot then? Yeah, we walk, we walk, okay. and um, yeah, over a long period of time. Yeah, I assume you can find some maps because the, mm -hmm. the Camino is so well organized now. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you can find a map that shows you uh, what are the best routes. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, well, the routes are, are pretty much, um, um, we are told where the routes are and we have a few choices, but, but um, we are going to try and do it next spring, but we don't know yet. But if I were to give you a map, would you be willing to point out some things to me that might be really... But uh, if you look, you know, you're going to have access to the PowerPoint. Okay. So I'm going to send you, if, if I have your email address, and yeah. I assume I do, mm -hmm. uh, you receive access to, to the link to the, the PowerPoint. And I have okay. shown you a map at the beginning where most of the okay. sites that, you, that I'm showing there, I have a, an arrow and show you where they are. And most of them are within you know, the coastal region. Uh, okay. There are some that are a little more inland, but that's the choice for you because as soon as you talk about inland, I mean, these are miles and miles to go. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. And again, I'm not showing you everything. Yeah. What I would suggest, because these I really love, I would suggest that you buy yourself the little eyewitness guide, uh, tour guide. Yeah. These are fabulous and they have the best maps and they have the best explanation on how to get there or where it is and the importance of it. It's beautifully illustrated. They're um, called Eyewitness? Eyewitness tour guide, yeah. Okay. And I don't have one Great. here. I have them about from every country where I've been because that's, it gives you good information on the food, on how to deal with people, it gives you a little vocabulary. Sure. Uh, I, I wouldn't go anywhere without one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start again. It's talking that's going to do the, the trip the, on foot. Pardon me? Yes. Who is the person that's going to do the trip on foot? Sue Parsibach. Sue Parsibach. Ah, oh, thanks. I'm trying to see which one she is. Yeah, I don't know because I don't have the same view as you do. So I have a friend. You, can, you can wave, Susan. Wave so she knows who you are. I have a lavender top on. You see, so, she's waving. <laughs> no, I can't find her. Anyhow, oh. I have a friend that did it that I was going to. Okay, okay. but you, what you can do? Oh, that's uh, it. I can. I can give you. Yeah, you found her. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, if you want to get in touch, send me both a little email and I will put you in touch. And I just sent uh, yesterday uh, a friend of mine that book you had rec recommended uh, in one of your lectures about that uh, trek. Yes. And, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I bought it for a friend. Was that the, fun, the funny one? Uh, I don't. I don't think it was funny. No, um, it was some guys. It was his uh, reminiscence about it. I didn't read it. I just bought it for a friend that no, did it. No, it's uh, written by Jack Hitt. I it, think so. Yeah, it's a uh, no. That's a funny one. At times, it can be a little more difficult than others. But he's a journalist, a freelance journalist from New York. And he decides to go because he either, either broke down, you know, broke up with his girlfriend or whatever, and he wants to do something to realize <laughs> who he is. And uh, he starts the thing at um, Saint. Oh, sorry. I think that's what I gave my friend that. Yeah, did and uh, so he starts at Saint Guillaume le Désert, which is the place where um, used to be the little convent, which is now the cloisters in New York. And he's trying to see where that monastery, the, the, the cloister used to be. And according to him, nobody remembers where it was. <laughs> and, and so that's the way it starts. But then he gives you all these very picturesque story about all the people he encounters on the, on the way. And there are some really crazy people <laughs> too. Maybe that book would interest you. Yes, but that's the, 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 the road to, from uh, France. So I don't know if you're interested oh. in character. Um, but anyway, that's a funny book. That's a funny book. There are tons of books on, on the Santiago, the El Camino. Yeah. That's okay, anyway, guys, I have to go on because we still have to cover a lot of material. Uh, so I'm uh, asking you, let's see if I can still... Uh-oh. Mute you all, and I'll talk to you at the end. And here. So, in 1762, uh, Spain invaded the Portuguese territory. Uh, that was part of the Seven Years' War. But, uh, I've lost, I, yeah. excuse me, I've lost the picture. I don't have any. Ah, I don't know. You know, get out and come back. I don't know because I'm, I have no control on the pictures for you. I tried that. All right. Try to get out and come back and then I, I'll open it to you. So, um, but unfortunately, by 1763, the static quo between Spain and Portugal uh, comes back. But um, the very important figure is going to come up on the scene. And this is the Marquis of Plombal, who is actually going to rule Portugal for the king until Joseph I's death in 1779. That very interesting figure uh, was Secretary of the State of Internal Affairs of the Kingdom under Joseph I. And um, he will be the most prominent minister in the government. He had started as a diplomat in 1738, where he went to uh, London and later to Vienna. The Queen Consort liked him very much. Uh, and after his first wife died, she arranged for uh, the Marquis uh, to marry the daughter of an Austrian field marshal. However, the King uh, John V of Portugal didn't, uh, wasn't very pleased with that. He brought uh, Mello back. He, his real name was Mello, by the way, to Portugal in 1749. But then John died the following year, and his son Joseph I of Portugal, uh, who was very fond of Mello, uh, 
appointed him as Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the man was so smart in the way he handled everything that very quickly uh, his power increased. The king entrusted him with more control of the states. And then by 1755, he was made prime minister. He had been in London and so impressed by the economic success of Britain, uh, he is going to start to implement similar uh, economic uh, policies in Portugal. He is, and that's really interesting, he's going to abolish slavery in Portugal prior to most of the countries in Europe at that time. And uh, also abolish slavery in the Portuguese colonies in India. He reorganized the army and the navy, restructured the University of Coimbra, and ended up discrimination against different Christian sects in Portugal, which means the Protestants, of course. But uh, what is the mo he's the most known for are the amazing reforms uh, in the economic and financial fields and the creation of several companies uh, that uh, to regulate every commercial activity. He uh, went into uh, pretty detailed reforms, including the production of uh, port wine to make sure, uh, to ensure the wine's quality. Uh, and this was one of the first attempts in Europe to control wine quality. Uh, he ruled with a very strong hand and uh, uh, had very strict laws upon class, all classes of Portuguese society, from the high nobility to uh, the poorest uh, working class. Of course, all these reforms and his power uh, gained him enemies in the upper class particularly, and uh, they despised him as a social upstart. But it is thanks to uh, the Marquis of Plombal, and we told that, we called that region the uh, Pombaline era and the Enlightenment, and this is corresponding to the Siècle des Lumières, the Enlightenment in France. He was in power when the famous uh, earthquake happened, that terrible 1755 uh, Lisbon earthquake. And uh, this one, uh, they estimate now that the magnitude was between 8.5 and 9 on the scale of Richter. Uh, this fell on, upon Portugal in the morning of the 1st of November, 1755. Um, and uh, the city was literally, the city of Lisbon was raised to the ground. Uh, there was a terrible tsunami and lots of fires around. Uh, the Marquis of Plombal survived apparently a very lucky thing, and then uh, started immediately rebuilding the city. And that the uh, center that I put on top is um, supposed to have been said by him, uh, what now? We bury the dead and take care of the living. What is interesting is despite the calamity and the huge death toll that happened at that time, uh, Lisbon suffered no epidemic and within le less than one year uh, was already being rebuilt. And of course, taking advantage of starting from scratch, they were able to rebuild the cities with beautiful avenues and uh, very large buildings. So they call literally the center of the city, the Pombaline city center, uh, which is now very much a touristic um, attraction. The new ruler uh, is going to be a woman. The uh, Portuguese didn't have a Salic law, which was preventing women to, to be in power. Uh, but Queen Maria I of Portugal disliked the Marquis because of his power. And so she, uh, when she accessed the, the throne, she withdrew all his political offices and the guy died shortly after in his estate in 1782. But the Queen Maria suffered from what they called religious mania and also melancholia. Uh, she um, 
had that acute mental illness that made her incapable of handling state of affairs after 1792. Um, it was noticed already in 1786 when she had to be carried out of her apartment in a state of delirium. By May 76, uh, 17, 1786, sorry, her husband died, and the the queen was devastated. Uh, forbade any forbade any court entertainment. But shortly after, shortly after, of course, in the early part of the eighteen uh, hundreds, the Napoleonic troops and um, uh, the Brit and also at the urging of the British government, the whole dynasty decide to flee uh, in 1807 to establish a government in exile uh, from Brazil. And it is there in 1816 that she died at the Carmel convent in Rio de Janeiro at the age of 81. Though she is a greatly admired figure in both Brazil and Portugal because so many changes and events took place during that time. And she was also, of course, celebrated as a strong female figure. Her legacy, as far as we're concerned in, in uh, art, is the Chateau of Kelouch. Uh, this is a um, Baroque Rococo masterpiece uh, that she had conceived. This is, you see here, the early uh, Chateau, the way it looked in the 17th century. But this is what it's going to become built between 1747 and 1760. Uh, it's not far from uh, Lisbon and it's a, a lovely uh, one day visit that you can do. It also houses a whole collection of painting though the portraits are not too attractive I have to admit. Um, this was one of the last great Rococo building to be designed in Europe uh, and became literally a summer retreat uh, for the uh, king consort, uh, Don Pedro de Braganza. It has been compared with uh, Versailles because of the facade and the French style garden, uh, but it differs uh, from the, the great uh, chateau in the sense it's a, a smaller scale and has a little more neoclassical features, except for the pavillon there uh, on the left uh, that is, was built by French architect Jean-Baptiste Robillon. Nowadays, the palace is, uh, serves to house some uh, foreign personalities, uh, also used for concert exhibitions and pageants. It's a very pretty place to be. As you can see, just like in Versailles, lots of uh, fountains, pretty facade, and then, of course, the azulejos, these famous tiles, either polychrome or just blue and white, um, are just a real pleasure. This used to be a canal. Uh, where uh, the, the court would just uh, go on, on barges. The interior can be visited. You have the throne rooms, the tea room, the azulejas hallways, the music room. <coughs> and to me, one of the main places is the restaurant. You have the chapel, of course, but the restaurant, Cocina Velia, uh, is a superb, it's actually a house in the old kitchens of the chateau. And uh, as you can see, a marvelous a marble table uh, and offers a superb uh, cuisine. The azulejos, the Portuguese glaze tiles, are actually one of the, the best and most original uh, decorative arts. A lot of the 16th and 17th century are lined with these tiles, and then you have the rooms and whole of palaces that are entirely tiled by these azulejos. The techniques were actually introduced in Portugal by King Manuel I after a visit to Seville uh, and saw the mansions that had been tiled uh, in Seville.
And here are some of the examples. This is in Tavira, the, the uh, Church of the Misericord. But with the occupation by Napoleon, Portugal became kind of unfortunately a, a slow decline that lasted until the uh, 20th century. This was uh, hastened by the independence of Brazil. So they lost, of course, a lot of resources. Uh, and definitely by the end of the 19th century, Portugal lost most of its other colonies, except for Angola and Mozambique. On February the 1st, 1908, the King Dom Carlos of the I of Portugal and his eldest son, uh, Don Luis Felipe, Duke of uh, Braganza, were assassinated in Lisbon. And you can see the representation of that regicide uh, up above there. Uh, they were assassinated by two Portuguese Republican activists. Unfortunately, under his rule, the uh, country had been declared bankrupt. And so after the uh, assassination, it's the second and youngest son, Manuel II of Portugal, became the new king. But he was uh, eventually uh, overthrown a few years later by a Portuguese Republican revolution, which abolished the monarchy and installed a Republican government in Portugal. And this is what you see in 1910, the proclamation of the Republic, uh, after Manuel II had been acclaimed as king, but that didn't last very long. The First Republic had a lot of problems. Portugal had 15 different governments in just 15 years, sorry, 45 different governments in just 15 years. Um, then we see the uh, First World War, Portugal helped the Allies to fight the Central Powers, uh, but unfortunately it hurt its economy. And so this condition would lead to the creation of the National Dictatorship, Dictatura Nacional, which led to the establishment of the uh, right-wing dictatorship of the Estado Novo under Salazar, that you see here on the right. Portugal, and that's going to last until 1968. Portugal was neutral during World War II. Um, and then some independence movement in the provinces of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea resulted in the Portuguese colonial war uh, between 1961 and 1974. So, in April 1974, a military coup known as the Carnation Revolution um, it gave the independence of the overseas territory in Africa and Asia and the restoration of the democracy after two years of a transitional period. Uh, so now the first uh, legislative elections of 1976 the Portuguese Socialist Party uh, came with uh, Mario Suarez, that I think many of us remember, who became the prime minister of the first constitution, constitutional government on the 23rd of July. And here is uh, Mario Suarez. Nowadays, the president, the 20th president of Portugal is Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa and Antonio Costa, the 119th prime minister of Portugal since 2014. Some of the buildings occupied by the government are the beautiful Belém Palace, which is the official residence and workplace of the presidents of the Rep Republic in uh, Lisbon. He is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Who would love to work in these? This was a convent before. Then it became the residence of the kings of the Braganza dynasty. And then part of the famous construction by the um, by Plombal are these uh, ministries of the government in Portugal and behind there, all the large avenues that make the center of uh, Lisbon.
So let's look at quickly at Lisbon and of course uh, Lisbon on the Tajus River with you see here the Caravels and the Caracs and the chateau that dominates uh, Lisbon for those of you that have been there. It has a strategic location, of course, uh, on the mouth of the Tajus River. And then you have these fortifications that go back a long time, were taken also by the, uh, the Moors and then the multiple kings. So the castle is very much in the center of Lisbon on the hill. Sorry. Uh, it was, of course, constructed during the Moorish occupation. Um, it had a citadel, then was taken over uh, by Afonso Enriquez uh, once he became king. And this became uh, the siege, uh, the, it became really the seat for the, the king. It was a very well defended uh, building and housed the royal palace of the Alcasova. The cathedral, cathedral, which of course suffered tremendously of the uh, earthquake in 1755, uh, shows here the recreation of the Lisbon Cathedral of the 16th century. And you can see the C, what is called the C, Lisbon Cathedral. It housed normally the royal pantheon. Uh, and cloister and many chapels that were completely destroyed. Looking from the upper part of the city, you can see the um, neighborhood of Alfama, very pretty, very colorful, where you have two, uh, the monastery of Sao Vicente de Fora, St. Vincent outside the walls, uh, that has uh, in 1834, suffered from the dissolution of the monasteries in Portugal and where it was transformed into a palace for the Archbishop of Lisbon uh, and then later uh, transformed the old refectory into a pantheon, as you can see on the right, where the tombs of the house of Braganza are uh, sitting. So beautiful old tapestry, uh, sacristy with all different colored marble. And then the church of Santa Ingracia that you saw in there too, which has been itself turned into a pantheon uh, where the important uh, Portuguese personalities are buried. Beautiful architecture inside. But the Alfama is also known for its beautiful little street. You can really go there very narrow. You can almost say hello, touch hands uh, on the upper floors, uh, pretty at night and during the day. Along the coast in Lisbon is the famous Geronimos Monastery built in 1495. Uh, the Manuel I selected the religious order of the higher Hieronymit uh, monks to occupy the monastery and their role was to pray for the king's eternal soul and to provide spiritual assistance to navigators and sailors. And this is what they did until 1833 when again the religious orders were dissolved and the monastery was abandoned but it's an extraordinary building particularly if you look at the that, uh, right porch, very manueline, again, that particular um, end of the Renaissance architecture, very ornated around the, uh, the porches, around the gates. It is a composite of Portuguese styles, um, you have laid Gothic architecture with the influence of the Spanish plateresque that you can see here in the porch, very ornated, 
also some Mudeja and Italian uh, architecture, even with some Flemish elements. The French sculptor is responsible for a lot of the I can get here. yeah uh, for a lot of the the sculpture pro sculptural program around the south portal his name was nicolas de chantraine now uh, known in uh, portuguese as nicolas de chantraine and i apologize for the accent uh, on the other hand for the whole south portal is joao de castillo so obviously from castile It's, it's marvelous and you have these are actually pretty uh, flemish in, in few they resemble very much uh, the dijon um, cartusian monastery sculptures by sluter the inside of the church is spectacular uh, this is uh, the church of santa maria in the same building in Berlin. All the, the columns covered with sculptures. This is the cloister of the Geronimos monastery. And then um, another example of uh, cultural, international culture, if you want, is that sculpture by Philippe de Vries, who is a Flemish, Franco Flemish sculptor, who was uh, called to Portugal to. Um, work on different buildings. He worked in Lisbon and in Tamar. He even traveled to India with the Viceroy. And it is in that same church that uh, the uh, tomb of Vasco da Gama is. This is a uh, rebuild, if you want, of the, of the tomb because it's it done in the Manueline style, but it's a more recent uh, building. A uh, piece actually. They sell to celebrate the 1898 fourth centenary of the arrival of Vasco da de Gama. They restored the tomb in 1894. Just across from the Geronimos, just a, a little more north, is the famous Torre de Belém. Uh, this, of course, Belém is a Portuguese word for Bethlehem. It was built in the early 16th century uh, during the height of the Renaissance, uh, the Portuguese Renaissance, and is again uh, quite an example of the Manueline style. It's composed of a bastion and a 30 meter, about 90, almost 100 feet, uh, four story tower. And you see it on uh, really a good protection against uh, some of the ships, French ships that were trying to enter the Tigris mouth. And here you see the, the cannons. And here's a view of uh, um, Lisbon with these very large avenues and, and the building typical of the 18th century. The Avenida de Liberdade that you see on your uh, left is, uh, has one of the most expensive shopping streets in uh, Europe. Also in Lisbon is an extraordinary um, Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation, one of the richest museum in Europe. Uh, it is also one of the wealthiest foundation in the world uh, and it houses, as I say, the largest private collection of not only antiquaries but also art uh, in the world with the Gulbenkian Museum. He dedicated that to the promotion of arts, philanthropy, science and education. It was founded in 1956 according to the last will and testament of Kalus Sarkis Gulbenkian, uh, who 
uh, was a Portuguese-based oil magnate who bequeathed his asset to the country in the form of a foundation. And there is a really interesting thing because he had uh, an enormous apartment in Paris where he was holding his collection. And there was a, a discussion at the time that he would give his collections to France and they refused. And this is so amazing. Anyway, Portugal accepted him with great pleasure. Uh, an expert that actually had visited uh, the, the house in Paris said that he never in modern history has one man owned so much. It was a four-story house, three basement on the Avenue de, de Diena, which is in the center of Paris, and was absolutely, as they say, crammed with art. He actually lent some of uh, paintings, only 30 paintings, to the National Gallery in London and Egyptian sculpture to the British Museum. So he collected over 6,400 pieces of art. And that was ranging from antiquity to the 20th century. He actually is one of the one, very smart, who uh, bought some of the collection of the Soviet sale of the Hermitage paintings when the Soviets came to power. He gave his collection to Portugal uh, under some condition, and that was not to part with it. And this is, you have a, an image there of some of the objects as well as the uh, works of art that he collected. It's an extraordinary museum. North of uh, Lisbon, we already talked about uh, Sintra, uh, but Sintra is full of castles. We, we saw some others. Uh, this one is quite interesting, was originally built on a monastery and then re renovated extensively through um, the initiative of Ferdinand II of Portugal. This is a very, what you would call the romanticist castle. Uh, it's on the top of the hill in the Sintra mountain. And actually by very clear day, you can see it from Lisbon. But it's so much an expression of the 19th century uh, romanticism. Uh, it's used from time to time by the president of the Portuguese Republic. Uh, and it is really interesting because for a long time, the ruins remained untouched, but then a young Prince Ferdinand in uh, 1838 decided to acquire the old monastery and then started to rebuild it. But he rebuilt it in real fantasy world. It's almost like Disneyland in uh, compact Disneyland, if I can say. So he actually charged a, a German engineer, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Ludwig von Eschwege, uh, to uh, and the guy had traveled a lot to start building and designing the castle. And, but according to a lot of his uh, own idiosyncrasy. So uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Maria II uh, gave their ideas on the kind of symbolism they want. They wanted vault arches. They want medieval and Islamic elements to be included too. And this is the result that you can see the pena National Palace. And this is where I'm talking about Disneyland because it really looks like Disneyland. Actually, after the death of Ferdinand, the palace passed into the possession of his second wife, who then sold it to King Louis. And uh, then in 1889, it was purchased by the Portuguese state and after uh, 1910 was classified as a national monument is now a museum. And here are some of the particular uh, architectural details, uh, a mythological Triton and then the clock tower. Other quite special uh, palace in uh, Sintra is the Palacio de Montserrat. Um, 
it was originally a chapel dedicated to Virgin Mary. Then it was owned by uh, the hospital, uh, hospital of uh, Lisbon, and then finally uh, went uh, into the hands of the Mello and Castro family. But then after the 1755 earthquake, uh, it became unlivable, and so it's an English merchant uh, that bought the place. And uh, they started designing a particular landscape garden. And uh, finally, in 1863, when the property was uh, bought by Francis Cook, who was an English merchant, uh, he started to work with uh, James Knowles, an English architect, and it became the summer residence of the Cook family. And again, it's completely influenced by Romanticism. And you have a, a revi um, Mudejar Moorish revival as well as neo-Gothic elements, quite a fantasy world too. Sintra must have been inspiring, I assume, because it's not the only one. Here you have the Quinta de, da Regalera that has had many owners. And again, you have that um, architecture it belonged to Carvalho Montero, uh, who wanted to build it as a bewildering place where he could collect symbols that reflect his interest in ideology. So in there, you find symbols of alchemy, masonry, Knights Templars, and Rosicrucian. And so you have elements of uh, Roman, Gothic Renaissance, and Manueline styles. It finally was acquired by Sintra Town Council in 1997 and is also a museum. More traditional is the Alcobaza uh, Monastery, about 120 kilometers north of Lisbon. A Roman Catholic monastic complex. It was established in 1153 by the first Portuguese king, Alfonso, Alfonso Enriquez. Uh, and these were some of the first Gothic uh, buildings in Portugal. You can see an early Gothic interior there. The cloister is, is quite uh, remarkable. And then it also houses a series of uh, tombs. Tombs of King Pedro I. North of uh, Lisbon is, of course, the town of Oporto. We always call it Porto, but it has an article in front of it. It makes it Oporto. Population of uh, close to 300,000 people. But the metropolitan area of 2.3 million makes it the second largest urban area in uh, Portugal. It's of course where uh, is uh, made the, the, the wine, uh, the port wine. Um, beautiful avenues, it's a, it's a very beautiful uh, city with a lot of uh, also Art Nouveau uh, buildings. The cathedral, the C do Porto, the cathedral of Porto was built in the uh, 1110 and was uh, transformed and then restored all the way to 1737. It's flanked by two towers, it's a very stronghold like with uh, two buttresses, but the interior is uh, extremely rich and this shows you the uh, beautiful retable, very baroque with these large tourist columns. Also in Porto is the uh, church of uh, two, so those clerico, clerico, clerigos, sorry, uh, with the large tower that you see on the right that uh, depends on it too, was built um, two, when you say clericos is uh, clergy, so the brotherhood of the clergy, was built by an Italian architect who was started in 1732 and finished in 1750, pretty quickly uh, made. And this is another church, the Church of St. Francis, with the extraordinary interior that it's all 
uh, inner decoration, it's all uh, gilded to wood, sculpted wood. You wouldn't believe it when you see the kind of uh, uh, simple facade. And here's the, the ceiling again with some of the woodwork, extraordinary woodwork. But some modern buildings too, and this is the Casa de Musica uh, that was uh, designed by a Dutch architect, Rem Kohlhaas. A very interesting building, uh, as I say, completely uh, ultra-modern, but uh, has kept in some of the rooms some of the uh, beautiful elements of uh, Portuguese art with the Azulejos wall. This is in the VIP hall and this is one of the uh, concert halls. There are many in there. Uh, they have also an interactive computer room. Now, by somebody that I know who knows the building, he, he is very sad of all these uh, windows that unfortunately are not respected from the inside because people are storing all kinds of things along the window. And so when you look at it, you can see it from the outside. So that's always the problem with between the, you know, the inhabitants of the place and, and those that design it. We've talked many times about the uh, Coimbra, Coimbra, who was the capital of Portugal from 1131 to 1255, but is particularly known for being the seat of the University of Coimbra uh, that uh, was founded in 1290. And it's the oldest academic institution in the Portuguese speaking world. This is the Manueline facade of the Monastery of Santa Cruz which is the final resting place of the first Portuguese monarch, Afonso Henriques. So the city was very much uh, profited from the stewardship of uh, Henriques, uh, who built and, and pushed the, uh, the economy of the place. Here, the extraordinary pipe organs in that monastery. Another of the monasteries of uh, Santa Clara Avella and some of the medieval houses, what they call the Sobrado, which means more than enough. And then of course, a uh, part of the university, this is the front facade of the Joanin Library building. Uh, this is a Baroque library that uh, is a very historical building and contains some superb editions of very rare books. Keeping going north, you have Braga, which was also a very important city, uh, was known under the Roman Empire as Braga Augusta. Uh, you have a castle, uh, inside it can be visited and it's also a major hub for uh, going uh, into the northern Portugal. It's the seventh municipality in Portugal. Here are some of the, that's the cathedral, the Archiepiscopal Palace of Braga where the Archbishop would live and then a new wing that was added to it later on. Also, the, the uh, church of uh, Bon Jesus do Monte, uh, quite interesting, that was uh, built in 1722 with that incredible staircase that leads you all the way to that, that church, uh, was uh, rebuilt in the 15th and 16th century. And it's a pilgrimage church. And that explains a lot of the uh, staircase because people would uh, go up there, a part of the pil pilgrimage. The present sanctuary was started in 1722. 
So the, the uh, segment of the stairway that has that zigzag shape is dedicated to the five sense. The sight, smell, hearing, touch, and taste is represented by a different fountain on each of them. And some of the landscapes that you can uh, enjoy. This is the Peneda Guerres National Park. This is the northern part of Portugal. You have some very wide, this is the only national park in Portugal. Now looking towards the south, as we mentioned already, uh, Lisbon is here, so the Alentejo and the Algarve uh, are uh, much more rolling hills, but they also considered as the breadbasket of uh, Portugal, a lot of uh, uh, agriculture. So you have very large uh, properties here and intense farming export. And if you go to the coast, you can, of course, they have these uh, marvelous beaches. They still, you know, not packed. You still can find some uh, beaches where you, you can breathe. Though there are some that are packed and some that are much more commercial, as you find in the Estremadura, in Beira Litoral, and in uh, Cascais for example, here, which is a much more resort-oriented uh, type of uh, town. But we also have, and we keep, to forget, you know, we keep forgetting about it, we also have some islands that are still Portuguese. Uh, one is Madeira, of course, with the capital city Funchal, uh, the autonomous region of Madeira. It's one of the two, you have the Azores in, um, and Madeira, of course, um, of uh, volcanic origin. So it gives it a completely different uh, relief. Very good food. You have lots of seafood. The Madeira wine, of course, which is a fortified wine um, on the right, but beautiful landscapes. It's also known for its uh, deep green laurel forest that are still intact. So these are very old massifs of uh, laurel, oleanders. The Azores, uh, again, also of volcanic origin, unfortunately uh, encounter a lot of seismic uh, events. The last one being in 1957-58 uh, was the last eruption, but regular, uh, earthquakes, of course. The archipel is composed of uh, nine volcanic islands and also has uh, one of the highest uh, peaks in uh, Portugal, which measures about uh, 7,713 feet and is really the iconic uh, symbol and you can see it uh, there. Main industries, dairy farming, livestock, fishing, and tourism. For those of you that have been in Portugal and are more familiar with Spanish and other uh, Romance language, uh, Portuguese is always kind of a mystery. And so I brought you this interesting evolution of the Iberian language and territories. So you can see how the Castilian is going to take over Spain, except for that part. But the Galician is very closely associated with Portuguese, as you can see. This is the map of the Portuguese language in the world. So you have the native language, uh, definitely in Brazil and Portugal in green. It's the administrative language uh, still in Angola uh, and Mozambique. And then uh, you have some of the cultural or secondary language. And to 
finish the, the presentation, of course, I bring you always some good things. And these are the different wines you can find in Portugal, uh, fortified wines or uh, just table wines. Um, knowing, of course, the Vigno Verde that is uh, quite known, but a lot of very good wines in Portugal, as well as very good food. Here are some of the transportation here in Porto of the barrels of uh, port wine. And then for the foodies, you have the Caldo Verde made with potatoes and shredded collard greens and chunk of chorizo. Bacayao, which is the salted cod that not too many people really like here, but it's a real um, great dish in, in Portugal. The grilled sardine, the uh, carne de porco a la alantejena, the combination of pork and clams, excellent. Arroso doce, this is a dessert, rice pudding, and the pastage de Belém. Uh, the custard tart, which are absolutely delicious. Music is a, a must in, in, uh, in uh, Portugal. Uh, you have the guitar, which as you can see has a different um, shape as the Spanish guitar. Uh, you know, the uh, Spanish guitar uh, is actually comes from the Moors. Um, and uh, this has taken a different uh, view. It, it's quite interesting. It has uh, 12 uh, steel strings strung in six cores of two strings. Now, the uh, music that is very typical of Portugal is the fado. And the fado, if you haven't heard it, uh, is amazing. The queen of the fado was Amalia Rodriguez. Uh, that passed away since. But it's a very melancholic type of uh, music. Uh, it's very sad. It actually goes back uh, officially around 1820s, but seems to have its roots uh, much earlier than that. And it really captures the, the uh, Portuguese, that idea of longing, of feeling of loss. So uh, if you haven't heard it, I have um, I have a, a video here that you can hear. I'm not going to do it because we passed the time. And on the left, uh, on the upper left there, you have uh, some of the Coimbra students playing their guitar. So next time we now finished with the summer, we go back to art history on me. Uh, we'll have on 1st of September, the Gonzagas in Mantua and the art of Andrea Matenia. Uh, this is for the uh, Tuesday series, and then the Thursday of the next week, we'll start with uh, 18th century painting and art. Somebody is asking a question. I'm going to stop the recording.